Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Charting Toward Intimacy covers mature topics. Listener discretion is advised. Hey there, welcome to Charting Toward Intimacy, where we're expanding the natural family planning conversation. I'm your host, Ellen Holloway. All right, we are here with Emily Frazee, um, and I'm very excited to have this conversation on the podcast today. We're talking about fertility awareness and NFP mindset coaching. This is something that Emily has been doing for over a year now, and uh, this is something that I am going to be offering, um, something very similar to what Emily's been doing. And on that, Emily, uh, welcome to the podcast. Thank well, you. Welcome back. I mean, you've been on yeah. here like three times now. It's been a while and I'm going to, I'm going to not be insulted by that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the last time that I had you on, it had been maybe like six to eight months since you had been on before. And you were like, yeah, you should just invite me on like every six months and I'll just have something new to say. So <laughs> we're really keeping up wow. with the, <laughs> I am, I am nothing if not forward. <laughs> <laughs> it's perfect. All right. So, um, so we're going to be talking about what fertility awareness and NFP mindset coaching is, Mm -hmm. why Emily started doing it, why I'm going to start doing it, um, what the need is. So Emily, could you just start by, um, kind of sharing like how you got into it, um, and where, where you kind of started from? Yeah. So Insta DMs, (laughs) (laughs) they, uh, it was like, you know, there, there's something incredible that happens whenever you talk about sex on your platform, everybody wants a piece of it. Um, it's kind of like, about it. <laughs> like sex sells or something. I don't know. Anyway. Um, yeah. So, I mean, I just, you know, I like opening up just honest conversations about sex and NFP because we see honest conversations about, you know, sex everywhere else, but within the church. And I'm just like, okay, can we like have, we, we have language, we have teachings that are beautiful and mm-hmm. that people either don't understand or they understand. And then when, no pun intended, the rubber meets the road or doesn't, um, <laughs> it becomes difficult. And they're like, okay, so the theology is telling me this and like, rationally, I get it, but it is presenting me like this huge cross in practice. And I don't know where to turn to for help and support. And so that was, I was just getting so many DMs, um, from people with like having questions or like, you know, I have this struggle and I don't know where to go. And so I just, I was like, oh, well, (laughs) I can handle this. Like, let's do this. And it really just became this thing that I discovered I love doing and that people need, but that, (laughs) I need to have healthy boundaries about when and how I do it because yes. otherwise I'll be like, peace out, husband and kids. I got some problems in the world to take over. And, um, yeah, that's just not the way it's supposed to be. I'm like, I'm very, uh, had a lot of life experiences that it's just like, you know, I have a primary and secondary vocation. My primary vocation is my husband and kids. My secondary vocation is everything that I do in this space, which I love. It's my passion. It feeds who I am and then helps me to pour out. But my secondary vocation feeds my primary vocation. And if I ever get those flipped, both of them will suffer. So it was like in the, in order to serve myself well, and in order to serve the women in that space, well, I was like, we have to formalize this. We have to, I have to turn this into something where like I can define boundaries, which means <laughs> money will be involved. Um, and that way, like I can set times and like, if people come in my DMs with a question, I can be like, you know what, this is a fabulous question. I'm so glad you asked, but this is a question I handle in coaching and here's where you can go. And so it just became a way for me to put healthy boundaries on something that I love and to have it continue to be something that feeds me rather than takes control. So yeah, that's pretty much it in a nutshell. That's how it all got started. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I, I've heard so many great things about, um, some women who have been in contact with me 
who have gone through coaching with you. And they're like, oh my gosh, it, that, that's oh. what I needed. I, I needed someone to um, hear me out, or I just needed someone to point me in the right direction um, of, you know, where to look or who to talk to, or, um, or I needed someone to kick me in the butt and tell me I actually needed to go to therapy with my husband. Um, and that yeah, happens. I'll, I'll, do that. I'll do that butt kicking for you. I have <laughs> zero problem. And that's because I've been in therapy. So I know the benefits. So anyway, <laughs> Nothing wrong with therapy. Absolutely nothing wrong with therapy. Um, But I think that segues into a really important um, uh, topic here is that this coaching isn't therapy. Yeah. (laughs) It is not at all a replacement for therapy. (laughs) I do not have a license of any kind. I have a lot of passion. (laughs) So, (laughs) you know, that, uh, um, yeah. It's just a matter of how to channel it, but yes, I, yeah, this is not therapy. This is I, the way that I view this is really in most cases, it's a segue to therapy. Um, and in my case, like the thing that was holding me up from going to therapy was, you know, when I was going through difficult times, the people that I was turning to for help responded to me with judgment and dismissal. Mm. And these are people who love me. And so I was like, well, if I'm getting this response from the people who love me, how, like, I I can't expect different from a stranger. Like if I'm going to go sit in therapy that, you know, the people who love me think that I'm like a schmuck for feeling and thinking the things that I feel a stranger is going to do the same thing. Yeah. And so it was so hard, like fine, but I hit like a breaking point and I went and I sat in therapy and on my first day I shared something and I'm not going to go into detail because you know, it's, this it's is one not therapy. It's like, <laughs> it's like, yeah, I know this is not therapy. Uh, <laughs> so I'll just hint at it and you get to try to guess oh boy. Uh, and I won't tell you whether you're right or wrong. Um, but I shared something that I had carried for years. That I was deeply ashamed of that happened during my second pregnancy. And it was the most incredible experience because my therapist saw me and she says, it makes total sense that you thought and felt this because you just wanted the pain to stop. And I was like, that was the most, I I was in complete shock because I was just like, she expressed what I felt better than I could. Yeah. And I was like, are you kidding me? Like she gets it and she doesn't think I'm a schmuck. She's like, no, I see right through this, uh, this, I totally understand where this is coming from. And I was like, wow. I was like, that shame was just released. And the power that this, this experience had over me was gone like that. And I had the ability. So I realized in that first therapy session, just the power of saying the truth out loud. And mm-hmm. especially when we're talking about NFP and sex, we're talking about things that a lot of people become deeply ashamed of. Mm-hmm. My husband and I use condoms. Um, I was on birth control. Um, you know, we went too far when we were trying to avoid my husband is pressuring me and telling me that he can't abstain. Like, I feel like the church is making me choose between my spouse and my faith you know, and these are things that they carry so heavy. And I like, I hear it constantly. And it's like, as soon as they say it out loud to another person who doesn't judge them, that it it creates this opportunity to become free. Like the same way that I experienced that in, in therapy, when I said, you know, that thing that I was ashamed of. And I, and, and that's what I try to do in this space is that, okay, we're going to name the thing. We're going to name it. We're going to say it. I actually, I had a client one time who she was, um, she was trying to describe something that she and her husband were going through and she was kind of using every euphemism in the book. And I just told her, I said, okay, can you stop for a second? I was like, I want you to say what you mean. And then she said it and I was like, okay, please proceed. Now I understand what you're talking about. And I didn't react, didn't say anything, you know, it was just like, but I knew it was, it was, it's not important for me to hear it. Like I understood what she was talking about from the euphemisms. It was important for her to say it precisely for it, for what it was and to know another human being heard it and understood it 
and didn't judge her. Mm-hmm. That's, that is the mechanism to freedom. That's the mechanism that becomes that catalyst for change. And so that's what I try to do in that space. I try to give people that experience of, I can say things I'm deeply ashamed of and not be judged. And then that opens them up to the possibility. Maybe I could experience that in therapy. Maybe there's other places where I could experience this. Cause I go to my friends, I go to my parents, I go to my siblings. I don't get this, but here's this stranger and she did it. And, you know, I, I, I will say, I think it is, you know, it's kind of part of our human condition it's easier to do these things with strangers. Yep. (laughs) Because I am, I am coming into this as a completely unaware third party. I don't have any baggage in a relationship with this person. I'm just coming in totally fresh and I am there with the person in front of me and no one else. And that's the person I'm tending to and no one else. And it, it becomes a very, um, freeing and healing space. Definitely. Definitely. So let's talk a little bit more about like who, who this coaching is for, who this mind mindset coaching is for. Mm -hmm. You kind of listed out a few examples of like questions that women, um, would come to you with in DMS, um, or, you know, things that they would bring to these coaching sessions. Um, but, but really like who is this for? I mean, and I would almost go to say everybody, um, (laughs) because I think, I think we all have, um, things that we need someone to listen to for us, or we need to say and have someone just listen to non-judgmentally. And then we all have places where, um, maybe we don't fully understand the theology behind, um, some Mm -hmm. of the things that we're called to practice as Catholics, um, or, we just don't have the support that we need, but, but really like, what are some of the, um, main things that if someone's experiencing this coaching would be a great place for them to start and, and get, um, support. Yeah. I'm going to answer your question in a weird way by describing who my ideal client is. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. This is for me. So there's two different aspects to this coaching. There is like the mindset coaching in that's involved in the practice of fertility awareness. And then there is coaching, um, to help decide, uh, which method would be best for you. So those are two separate things. Um, method coaching is for anybody. Um, that is like, you know, I can sit down with single married postpartum menopausal or perimenopausal, women, like, let's go through, like, let's look at your lifestyle. Let's look at your fertility needs. Let's think about your health needs. Let's like kind of run through these questions and then let's look at the methods and let's look how they work. And let's see what your, based on what your needs are, your personality, all that type of stuff. Let's see which method might be the best fit. Um, so that's the, the first component, the mindset coaching, my ideal client in that, in that space is married people. Um, it's not that I can't or won't talk to single people. It's just, that's not my forte. Um, so for me personally, talking to people who are struggling with where this intersects with marriage and, you know, I've been married for almost six years. So like somebody who's been married, like within the zero to 10 year range, I would say I'm probably pretty comfortable with, um, you know, not just, you know, I've had clients who've been married for like 20, 25 years and, um, they were wonderful sessions. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of, that's my comfort zone. Now who is fertility awareness or who is mindset coaching for it's, it's really for anybody who's like, okay, I'm just, I get NFP, but you know, NFP really kind of does me dirty. Um, (laughs) and (laughs) I come at it. I come into that space as a person who NFP did dirty. Okay. Like I understand, um, I was not prepared in marriage prep for, you know, I didn't know what my method options were. I didn't know what abstinence would look like. I didn't know it wasn't my responsibility to make sure my husband had as much sex as possible. You know, like all of these, (laughs) all of this baggage that we bring into marriage that like, it starts to come out and cause all of these problems And then you kind of have to work through it on the back end and you don't have any support. Like, who do I talk to about this kind of stuff? And I think 
and for women, especially, um, just to stereotype for a hot second, um, we need to talk stuff out. Mm-hmm. Like we do, like we just, we need to be able to express our emotions verbally. That's how we process, you know, we got to get it out. And that's, that's not a bad thing. I know women get shamed for that. They're like, oh my gosh, if she feels it, she's got to talk about it. And it's like, well, buddy, let me tell you, if the, if the other option is to suppress it, <laughs> you're going to have problems, bigger problems. If she expresses her emotions, that's healthy. If she <laughs> suppresses them, hide the knives. Um, <laughs> like, it's not good. Um, so I think, first of all, just recognizing that that need is healthy and it's good. It's just a matter of where do I go? And mm-hmm. that's where I think most people kind of, you know, hit a brick wall and um, it's hard to take that step. It's hard to take that step. And so that's what I, that's, you know, the reason why my Insta DMs blow up is because I open all kinds of cue boxes and like people ask me like deep, dark questions and I just answer them. And they're like, you didn't shame me. I went, I went on like some Catholic moms group for like two seconds I logged in, I looked at some comments and I was like, nope, because this woman was asking legitimate questions about oral sex, anal sex, um, and sex toys. She was like, what's, what's listed and what's not like, I don't know. Genuine question. Right. And in the comment section, women were saying, oh my gosh, this is some perverted troll. I hope like you're happy that you just came on here and just dropped all of this disgusting stuff. And I was like, I was appalled. Yeah. I was, I was horrified because I was like, what you just did is you just, you didn't, you didn't stop the curiosity. What you did is you told that woman, the church is not a safe place to find answers. Mm -hmm. So she's still going to go looking for answers, but now she's not going to go looking within the context of the church. Because she just got shamed and belittled and put down for legitimate questions. When people come into my DMs, the first thing that they do is they say, I'm so sorry, this is TMI, but I don't know where else to turn. And I'm always like, there's no such thing as TMI in, 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 on my page. Mm-hmm. Because I know that these are important questions. And you're not a bad person for asking them. You're a normal person for asking them. And what the, tra- like the, what the crime is is that you don't know where to go for answers and that you weren't, you weren't given these answers to begin with. Right. You know, the fact that we have just like gate kept so much stuff about sex. Oh, we can't talk about sex because sex is dirty until you're married and then you're married. And then it's like, what can I do? What can't I do? First of all, like now all of a sudden this is listed. I don't really feel like a sex goddess, but I'm supposed to be. So there's this whole cluster in my mind, you know, just messing things up. Um, but now like, what can I do? And, and because sex is approached with shame in so many of our conversations within the church, people who have questions, like, you know, I've had people like faithful Catholics come to me and say, I didn't know I couldn't give my husband a hand job during the period of abstinence. And I'm like, you know, I'm like, you know what? I am so sorry. You didn't know that. And I just like, I get angry at the people who are like, we can't talk about this. And this is what happens. And then people just wind up so confused and, you know, they're doing things that they shouldn't be doing, but they have no idea because we don't talk about this. We don't talk about this. It's, you know, it's sacred. It's sacred. We don't talk about this. And I'm like, it's sacred. And we need to talk about this Mm -hmm. because it's being talked about everywhere literally everywhere but within the church and that's causing incredible problems like to take this to the extreme i'm gonna take it to the extreme to illustrate my point i was on um i don't know if you follow style fit fatty i don't uh, i think she's mormon um but she posts like the most interesting stories and she had a series of stories i kid you not about belly button sex what I'm not, I'm not joking, not making this up. This is a thing. People are Belly so buttons are not that big. I have a lot of questions. I really have a lot know. of questions. This I is not the time to ask those questions. Continue. But 
this is how, this is how bad it is. Now, I don't know, like, if it's like within particular religious sex or whatnot. Um, but these people were getting married, literally did not know how to have sex. They thought the penis went in the belly button. Oh dear. Yes. And of course the belly button's not made for that. And some women were like, yes, it was like, it was causing problems and like no joke. And the, the, the worst case scenario was this man shared the story about how he and his wife thought this was how you had sex. They weren't having kids. So they went to go to an IVF clinic to start the process for um, IVF because they thought they were. I've heard this story before. (laughs) Yeah. And he's, you know, about to give his sperm sample and he's flipping through the porn magazines. And that's how he figures out what sex is. Oh, dear. Right. That's how he figured. So when we don't talk about sex, we're not protecting people. We're not treating sex as sacred. We're pushing people into, first of all, very damaging and unsafe practices, and also into really unhealthy places to learn about sex. Right. Right. He literally, like he's in there about to give a sperm sample and he's like, oh, we're just doing sex wrong. And he learned that by looking at porn. And we wonder why we're in the mess we're in. Yeah. And I wonder why I get, you know, DMs from women who were like, I'm so sorry. I don't know where else to turn to. And I'm just like, girl, like <laughs> that now the hatches because you're about to get a response using all scientific terminology and very explicit terms. I might throw in a joke or two, um, but it's beautiful that you're asking this question and thank you for doing so. And there's no such thing as TMI because I don't want that to happen on my watch. Mm-hmm. I don't want people to be shamed and be like, and to go look at porn and be like, oh, this is how it's done. Right. Like that's that is time. not, yeah, that is not where we as Catholics should be getting, that's not where anyone should be getting their answers about right. like sex and how it works. And, and then also just like what it's for, right? <laughs> cause, cause exactly. let me tell you the porn magazines, that's not what sex is for. <laughs> well, that's not really what sex is either. Well, it's that's like- true. Yeah, it's like no, that's that that's a very um a very warped way to understand that beautiful activity. But anyway, yeah, it just like that's that's what's at stake here. And it's time that we wake up. And so that's what mindset coaching is just you got questions, you're struggling. There's, you know, it takes a, it's to the point it takes a lot to shock me. It takes a lot, <laughs> it, you know, and even the things that I find shocking, I'm just like, you know, it, it's very easy for me to be like in this world, this makes total sense. Right. That these people find themselves in this situation. And because, I think that's, you know, yeah, I think that's something to understand about, you know, this coaching that we're talking about. Um, and we'll have in the show notes will be links, um, either, when, when you're listening, there may not be as many links, but, um, there will be soon. Um, the, the show note links will be updated, um, as, as they become available, but links to, um, signing up for coaching with Emily or I, um, but you know, this, this is, this is that space to, um, to realize like we, we understand because we have deeply ingrained ourselves in the Catholic teachings on sex and marital intimacy. And we also are recognizing what is going on in our world and in our culture. And so we understand, we can see where some of these um, misunderstandings can come from. And we're not surprised about them. We're not going to look at you and go, oh my gosh, you're crazy. No, we're going to look at you. Oh my gosh, you're a heathen. Yeah. Oh, we will never, (laughs) no, we will never say that. You know, you can come to us with these questions, with these, um, you know, oh my gosh, I just found out that this wasn't listed and I've been doing it for this long and and I don't know what to do. You can come to us with that and we will listen and and we will hear you out and we'll say, yeah, hey, I get it. I see how that could happen. You can come to us and say, I know this isn't listed, but I think it's dumb. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, I we'll talk about that too. too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, you know, and then they kind of explain why. And it's like, and the thing is, is like, there is, you know, my session so far, they're an hour. That is not even remotely 
a fraction of enough time to understand the full story that's going on. Yeah. And that's the thing is like, when I approach these conversations, I'm just like, I am getting told like a hair's width of the whole story. And that's all I can respond to. And I understand that there are, there's factors that influence people's behaviors and decisions and reactions that I don't, that I don't know about. And the reason why I know that again, like, is because of my own experience in therapy. Like I thought I knew myself Mm -hmm. and then I went into therapy and I was like, Oh, there's a lot I did not know. And so, but it, it was this encounter with my own humanity that it was like, wow, there's a lot there that simultaneously like made me more, it made me capable of greater compassion but also made me greater able to understand the mercy of God, Mm -hmm. you know, like this, I'm me and I didn't know these things about myself and I am, you know, doing things and making decisions and having reactions in a way without full knowledge. Mm -hmm. Now I need to get the knowledge. (laughs) That's why I'm in therapy. (laughs) You know, that's not my free pass. It's like, well, Jesus, you know, I just didn't know. And oh, well, oh darn. It's like, well, you had every opportunity to find out. Um, Yeah. So it's, you know, now I feel like I'm burned with glorious purpose because I know so much and I'm like, you know, I think something, (laughs) I think something important to know too about this coaching is um, when, when you come to Emily and I, while we personally may have never experienced what you're going to share with us, I think it's important for you to know that Emily and I, well, actually I'll speak for myself and then you can agree or not. (laughs) I'm fairly certain you'll agree. I myself, I have experienced doing illicit things and needing to go to confession for those and realizing after the fact that that was not something I should have been doing. And, and so, so you're coming to a person who knows that feeling and knows Mm -hmm. that fear of going to confession for that and knows that fear of saying it out loud, um, in Mm -hmm. confession. Cause I think that's one of the hardest things. Yeah. Is to actually to spit it out when you're (laughs) sitting in front of the priest, or if you're, maybe you're even behind a screen, it's still scary, like to, to spit it out and say what you said. And so, um, you know, we, we understand that feeling. We, we understand what you're going through and we're here to, we're here to help you through it. Yeah. It's, you know, the thing that I've realized, and this is what therapy has helped me open my eyes to, and this is literally the blog I just wrote like 30 minutes ago. Um, (laughs) it's that, you know, the thing that we fear in confession is that, you know, we're going to say the deepest, darkest, dirtiest parts of ourselves, and we are going to be judged, condemned and rejected. That is the fear. Mm -hmm. That's the fear. Um, the reality is that's never happened. You know, now I know priests are human and some of them can say things that are damaging. I'm not that's going true. to deny that. I'm but not Jesus deny that. Um, is and, not and, and that, you know, those types of experiences, I totally understand. Like if somebody has ever had that experience, like you ain't going, you ain't going back in that confessional anytime soon. No shame or judgment there. Um, but that is not what confession is when you go into confession. And this is actually the scarier part. Weirdly is that when you go into confession and you say the deepest, darkest, dirtiest parts of who you are, you are loved Mm -hmm. and you are forgiven. And it's like, you know, we get like a kickback. It's like, well, how, why? I'm, I'm like, I'm a dirty sinner. Like, yeah. Why do you love me? You know, because we have, we have so many broken human relationships, so much broken experience of love that we project that onto God. And we think that he's going to treat us the same way that other people do. And that, that is what we're trying to kind of reverse in this coaching space is that experience of, no, you can tell me the deepest, darkest, dirtiest things. And I'm going to sit there and listen, and I'm not going to judge you. And it has nothing to do with whether or not I've been in the exact same experience as you. It's that I recognize the fact that I'm a schmuck too. Mm-hmm. just cause it's different. Don't make it better. And, you know, and I keep doing like, I keep doing the same sins. I know they're wrong. 
I know what I need to do to stop. I know that like this is an unhealthy coping me- mechanism and what I need to do to change it, but I don't want to do the thing because change hurts and it's hard. And it's like, mm, I just rather just keep doing the sin because it's easy. <laughs> um, but you know, so I understand that about myself. And so again, it's like this encounter with my own humanity. It's like, it doesn't matter whether or not I've done the same thing as you. It's I can come into that space and see my humanity in you. I mean, like, yeah, no, I get there's more to the story. I get that there's more going on. I get that this is hard. doesn't matter why. It doesn't matter what. It just is. And I can see that. And I can, I can empathize with that. And that empathy, you know, I think some religious people think that empathizing affirms somebody in their sin, but the opposite is true. Mm-hmm. When you see somebody and you're like, I see exactly who you are, exactly what you told me, and you don't run and you don't shame and you don't judge, that experience becomes the very catalyst for that person who received that, who who was seen. That becomes a very catalyst for that person to change. It's not the the coaching space. I want to make it clear. The coaching space is not for me to change my clients. It's for me to give them an experience of being seen and not judged so that they can change themselves when and how is right for them. Mm -hmm. That's it. It's not about me. And I know that a lot of people (laughs) approach evangelization as, okay, well, here's the truth and you need to accept it right now. (laughs) Uh, That is very forceful. And, you know, God is not forceful. He's not forceful. He's very gentle. Um, you know, this world is so devoid of gentleness. Um, There's very little gentleness, but when we are treated with gentleness, that gives us the ability to change. And that's, that's what this coaching space is all about. Yeah, definitely. So um, you mentioned quite a few, you know, kind of uh, ideal clients or, or, or people that would fit well into the space. And there was just one more, before we close out, there's kind of one more group of, of women. Um, I wanted to point out that, um, really this would be very beneficial for, um, is engaged women. Um, yeah. if you're preparing for marriage mm-hmm. and you particularly have questions about what is licit or what is not, or if you are scared about what's going on, Um, because I think our purity culture has created a lot of that fear, um, in engaged women or, um, but yeah, really, if you just have, if you just have questions, if you're like, wait, how do I, how do I switch from off to on and, or like, what is even licit? Um, that, that is a really, um, a a great place to start your marriage is, um, is sitting down in a coaching session or multiple coaching sessions. Um, and, and, you know, being able to vent out some of those questions and concerns and fears and, you know, whatever else that is. Yeah. I think that's a really good point because a lot of women, yeah, I was certainly in this boat either a don't know how to have sex or they're told that sex is painful the first time and then it gets better. And that message that sex is painful actually becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy. Uh huh. (laughs) If sex is painful, that's bad. And you need to stop. And like, so, so the coaching space becomes a place where, you know, you can like sit down with basically like your, your older sister, who's been there, done that and be like, okay, let's have a chat about the logistics. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Emily. (laughs) Yeah. Thanks for having me. Let's uh, yeah. I'm excited to keep talking and um, yeah, we've got some fun things coming. We do. (laughs) Thanks so much for listening. Um, links for uh, both Emily and I's um, information for coaching is in the show notes. Please note that that's going to be updated um, as those things change or become available. Um, at the time of this recording, Emily is actually not accepting clients, um, but possibly when you're listening to it, if it's a couple weeks or months later, um, that link will be updated. Um, but you can uh, sign up for coaching with myself. Um, and if you are not following Emily and I on Instagram, that is a great place, um, to stay updated with, uh, what's going on with our, uh, coaching availability and our offerings. Um, so links to those are also in the show notes. Um, and over the past week prior to this episode coming out, 
um, I have been sharing um, some more personal parts of my story on Instagram. Um, And I would highly encourage you to go and check that out if you um, haven't already, because um, that speaks a lot to um, the main type of client I hope to be able to serve. And so if you fall into that category, um, please reach out to me um, and fill out the intake form to book a coaching session with me. Until next time.